thank you to Imke uh, for organizing uh, this uh, with me and uh, and Bruno and uh, TNO for organizing this first PhD and early career uh, early career researcher uh, academy. So uh, just just to be just some practical information, uh, we will begin with uh, we will start with uh, two uh, super interesting uh, keynote. Uh, lectures uh, from uh, Anna uh, Vertori, sorry for that, and Massimiliano Mazzanti. After that, we, we will have uh, um, the, the PhD presentations, which, are, which is the core of the, of the day, of the event. And uh, here uh, we will have the presentations and uh, questions and after uh, from from uh, from. Uh, uh, after that, the last part, the session three, is the feedback session, and uh, this is this was was uh, felt as an informal colloquium with some uh, some mentors, uh, and uh, of course uh, later we will see uh, how how it works. And uh, and uh, yeah, uh, just to be before before starting, I would like to introduce yourself to the to to, to the others. Well, I'm Nicola Barbieri, and I'm an eco environmental economist at the University of Ferrara. I'm a postdoc, and I'm working on eco-innovation and uh, other other uh, research fields connected to uh, green technologies. Um, Inke, if you... So, um, Inke, thank you, Nicola. I'm Imke, I'm from the University of Stellenbosch. I'm a lecturer there, but I'm also a PhD candidate at the moment. My name is Lucia Del Negro. I'm here representing the Catholic University of Milan, and I'm dealing with um, inclusive business and local innovation. And yes. <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm uh, Marco from uh, the University of the Basque Country, and uh, I have a background in environmental economics and uh, sustainability. Good morning everyone, my name is Suzanne Smith. I'm a PhD candidate at Stellenbosch University. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Paul Curry, uh, also a PhD candidate at Stellenbosch, uh, working on African urbanization. Hi everyone, I'm Diana, I'm a PhD student from Mexico, and I'm studying uh, direct uses of geothermal energy in my country. Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Pauline Cherunia. I'm a PhD, an external PhD student of Utrecht University and I'm based at Airwag in Zurich, Switzerland, and uh, my research is on sanitation in Nairobi. My name is Alain Groenewoud, I'm from the Eindhoven University of Technology, uh, Yeah, and I think we'll discuss the topic later. So. <laughs> so I'm Nathan Andrews, I'm from the University of Northern British Columbia in Canada, and my research is on natural resources and uh, the political economy of that, yeah. My name is Albert Roger, I work at the Centre for Economic European Research in Mannheim, I'm a PhD cool. candidate there. And my, my research is mainly in environmental innovation and environmental, environmental economics. I'm uh, Franz Berger, I'm the Dean of Social <coughs> Sciences at King's College of London, and I work on technology policy and the environment. Hi, I'm uh, Kunde Gessler, I'm a PhD researcher at the uh, Center for the Study of Governance Innovation and the Center of Excellence in Food Security in South Africa. Good morning to everyone. I'm Chiara. I'm from the University of Ferrara. I'm a PhD candidate there and I'm working in the connection between international trade and environmental economics issues. Good morning. I'm Bruno Turnheim. I'm a research associate and research fellow at King's College and University of Manchester. I look uh, primarily at sustainability transitions in energy, mobility, agri-food a little bit. Uh, historical questions, questions of destabilization, uh, and methodological method questions. Good morning, I'm Salvatore Monni. I'm an associate professor at Roma University. I'm a US economist. Um, I'm Massimiliano I'm a professor of economic policy at the University of Ferrara, um, environmental economist, ecological economist. Uh, an important thing, maybe given that we are sharing and I uh, have to uh, interact with PhD students, uh, I, I have my, my background is in political science and, and, and economics. So I am an economist, but uh, with a strong background in um, political sciences. Thank you for the invitation. 
Um, I'm an assistant professor in Antwerp University of Technology. I am uh, with sustainability transitions uh, for as long as the field exists, actually, uh, uh, before this, the whole field was really institutionalized. Um, I had the pleasure to run an international network that sort of provided contributions uh, to this vibrant, great field. Um, yeah, I collaborated with uh, Franz Berghardt as well uh, for a number of years. We were both running this program. Um, for today, um, I thought um, I choose a theme that uh, connects us all, uh, which is sustainability and appraisal of sustainability. Um, I will not talk much about sustainability transitions as such. Um, I made this choice because um, for two reasons. One is that this issue of sustainability is really unpacked in, in, in transition studies. We really assume solar PV, uh, wind, uh, it's, these are all sustainable options, but we don't really discuss who says that, for who is this, uh, in which context. So, um, so I want simply your attention to this theme by this talk. Now, second issue is that another very characteristic feature of our field is that we all do interviews, right? So uh, there is a strong dominance of qualitative research methods. And um, yeah, sometimes we feel that maybe we should quantify more or use more quantitative research or mixed method uh, research design. And I want to present today to you a method which is sort of uh, visually quantifying very qualitative type of uh, data, which I think is a very big asset to our field. <coughs> uh, I will present uh, insights from a project um, that was running in 2010, 2005, and we have just published a paper, which you can also check out if you're interested. Uh, it's available in uh, Scopus and um, free for download. Uh, so the talk is about unpacking sustainabilities in social technical transitions. Uh, the way how I would like to proceed is to first uh, discuss the problems with appraisals, especially in sustainability field. Then say a few words about the case uh, where which we sort of used as a background for unpacking. Sorry. Welcome. <laughs> <coughs> uh, very shortly about the theoretical framework, uh, methods, results, and conclusions. Um, I also chose for this type of setup because uh, I think in every PhD uh, trajectory, in every article, we have to have a good defined problem, research question, uh, method. So I want to stick to this uh, uh, frame. So problems with sustainability. Uh, I think I don't have to explain to you. You are all working in developing country. You fully realize that sustainable that reality is inconveniently complex. So uh, there are a number of underdetermined categories. There are many processes. Uh, we don't have enough evidence, sort of, to know which analysis of this complex uh, reality is really the correct ones. We are being pushed to simplify for analytical reasons, for um, to sort of deal with this complexity because our frameworks are unable to grasp this complexity. So we sort of focus and whatever is not part of this focus, we treat it as a context. And we present it as a sort of, uh, very often as an input for decision making, for policy make or recommendations. But you can imagine, the different individuals, different groups of people may have different views on this reality. They have very sometimes uh, co uh, the divergent perspective on what the problem is, what's the cause of it, and what's, uh, what should we do in the end. Very often what happens is, yeah, who has the strongest voice, who is most dominating, these persons, this group of uh, people are winning, and that's what defines, uh, what provides background to the decision making very often. So when we look at the sustainability field, that is even more complex, because sustainability is terribly uh, contested uh, concept. Uh, maybe you know the book of 
Susan Baker on sustainable development. She uh, uses uh, a sustainable development ladder to sort of encompass different views on sustainability. Uh, she argues that uh, sustainability and our approach to sustainability is very much linked with our beliefs about how the relationship of human and environment is being shaped. And if it is very anthropocentric, people then think, yeah, humans are dominating, we have to exploit nature for our own purposes. But there are also many of us who have very ecocentric uh, type of uh, perspectives. Uh, yeah, we think that nature is one of the elements that should be one of the elements of the whole ecosystem and it should be preserved. So you can imagine in this very complex, uh, uh, in, in, given this uh, terrible complexity, I think saying that something is sustainable is highly contested. I think we have to be very careful. Um, to, to deal with this complexity, uh, many people sort of thought about um, uh, how to deal with this. And, and, and one of the approaches is to have indicators. And you probably heard a lot about sustainability indicators. It's done uh, by many, many people. What often happens is that in developing context, sometimes we all come from the West. <laughs> we have a workshop with uh, people. We give these indicators to the people and say, no, do something. <laughs> I think it's very offensive uh, way of procedure. Uh, so um, we had to think hard about how to deal with this type of uh, uh, yeah, uh, procedures. Another problem with these uh, traditional uh, uh, methods is that yeah, when you look at the final ranking, it's sometimes very difficult to understand what's behind. And is it really so green, so great, as the picture shows? We don't know what the uncertainties are. We only know what's best and what's worse. Uh, so it's just a sort of a traditional ranking. So that's what these uh, traditional uh, appraisal methods do. They really ignore the uncertainty, ambiguity, ignorance. They only rank. They only say what's best and which option is the worst. So having this in mind, in our project, um, we were interested, um, it was in 2009-2010 when we started. At that time, in the sustainability transition field, there was not much work on experimentation. So we set up a project to sort of understand, yeah, what sustainability experiments really occur in developing countries. And we focused on two countries, Thailand and India, and we looked at solar PV, and urban mobility. And I brought a couple of uh, folders. If you're interested, this is the summary of, of the project. Now, one of the comments we got when we were applying for the money, it was funded by NVO, Dutch Research Foundation, was, OK, so great work, but how do you know that these projects are sustainable? How are you going to apprise them? And uh, that's when we sort of uh, uh, realize that all these traditional rankings and indicator type of work is, is simply useless. So we went to look a little bit more into uh, other methods. But before I get to really to explain um, what we have done, I wanted to explain that um, the reason why we went to Asia was because at that time, and probably also right now, what happens in Asia will really, has really global impact. So that's why we decided to study uh, these two countries. Um, and as I mentioned, there was not much work on experimentation. Most of the cases were on uh, Western uh, uh, contexts. Now the situation has changed. Uh, so this is 2009-2010 year. So this is the project we got with a number of uh, interesting partners. And as we were Proceeding, I have worked with a master student, and we have taken a very emergent approach to the um, to the way how we dealt with uh, mapping of all these initiatives. Um, so we looked at all the actors. We first mapped all the actors in the field of urban mobility, and then we checked what they were doing and what experiments, what projects they set up. Um, 
in the outcome of this work, we could then group them along certain what we call trajectories. So, for example, this is for Thailand. One of the trajectories was walking and cycling, shared transport system, public transport, so you can think about BRT, and alternatively fuel vehicles. So, for example, hydrogen rickshaw or solar rickshaw. So we call these uh, sort of emergent trajectories. And we looked at these different emergent trajectories in India, in Thailand, in solar PV, in mobility. I don't show everything, but I hope that's believe me that there was more. So for the assessment of these projects, we thought we need a very clear research question. Um, so uh, we decided to formulate it in the following way. How are emerging innovation trajectories for solar energy and urban mobility apprised under different perspectives in India and Thailand? And what are the implications for the governance and sustainability transitions? In terms of um, theori theoretical embeddedness, we base our work on transition literature, especially on the translation of sustainability work done by uh, mainly Adrian Smith. The definition of sustainability experiments, the biggest contribution of uh, Franz Berghout. Reflexive governance and ideas about uh, yeah, sustainable development, how our perceptions have changed and so on. And then the diversity uh, writings, mainly by Andy Stirling, who is saying that diversity is really great for adaptive capacity, it facilitates competition, improves the different um, social spatial context, and so on. So that was the theoretical embeddedness. And based on this, we have uh, identified four types of um, diversities, if you like. Um, uh, I wrote more words uh, than it is necessary, but I want to share the slides uh, with you so that it's uh, also clear. But I just want to quickly <coughs> go through all of them. So it's performance diversity is simply about how these different trajectories perform in terms of sustainability. So is walking and cycling uh, comparable to alternative uh, vehicles, for example, right? So this is the first form of diversity. And it also provided a sort of uh, a basis for further appraisals. Now, the second one is an appraisal uh, uh, diversity. So it's about understanding how different actors uh, assess diversity. So if I did the check in this room, each one of us would probably have a different idea about sustainability. So that's what we mean by the appraisal uh, diversity. Now the fourth one is sectoral diversity. So we were studying urban mobility and solar PV. So you can also compare there how different empirical domains or yeah, the real uh, systems out there, how they perform vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other. And the last one is geographical diversity. We were studying India and Thailand, two countries in developing world. Uh, so we didn't compare with Europe but between India and China. So this was the four types of, of, of uh, diversities that we have employed in our um, discussion. In terms of methods, I mentioned to you I had a database, so that's, that was the basis for this uh, identification of these different trajectories. Um, there were four of these databases with different possible trajectories, and we wanted to see, okay, this is what's happening in those countries. How do people apprise sustainability of these different options? Secondly, and this is linking to what I said in the beginning, we have chosen to work with multi-criteria mapping tool. Do you know it? <coughs> Does anyone know it? Is it this matrix that gets you? Really it's not multi-criteria analysis. Okay. Well, it's multi-criteria mapping. It's also a software-based tool if you Google. Um, it's created by Andy Sterling from Spru in UK. You can purchase, you can have a trial for free, but you can also purchase it for a longer time and um, yeah, maybe buy an abonnement. How do you call it? Abonnement. Subscription. Yes. Subscription. Subscription for longer if you plan to do more of research or more people want to 
used at all. Uh, so it's a software assisted and, and, and it's, it's a little bit different uh, appraisal method than what I mentioned in the beginning. In principle, uh, there are all the steps that you see in all the appraisals. So first choosing options, then defining criteria, assessing scores vis-a-vis, -vis, exploring uncertainties, then saying how do you see importance of the different options in different criteria, and then considering ranks. This method is different from traditional um, uh, methods because it opens up the discussion about sustainability. When you use indicators, it closes down. When you use this one, you open up because you're trying to understand what people say, what they have. Uh, uh, first of all, every one of us can express our opinion, and you can also say uh, under what conditions you make these claims. You're also free yourself to define what the criteria are for your assessment. So it opens up, it, uh, of course, the result is that you will see what's the best and what's the worst option. But the added value is the rich descriptions of the rationale why people uh, claim certain things. And you can also compare, for example, for example, how men see things vis-a-vis -vis women, or how academics judge uh, against uh, government uh, or policy makers. So there are many different uh, combinations of assessment possible. So I would like to go very quickly through all these uh, steps. Um, in terms of choosing options, so for us in this project, we already had these trajectories predefined. But there are also studies, and Will McDowell, uh, who was participating in this meeting, he all also made use of this method. But he did visioning with stakeholders here to identify these options. So you can go in different ways about this step. So options is simply all these trajectories that uh, we have identified. So for example, cycling and walking, shared transport system, public uh, transport, and so on. And you introduce it in the system. And here you can sort of click and explain exactly what is meant by that. So you have a very um, uh, uh, thick description of every trajectory. Then the second was defining criteria. And as I mentioned, we have made in individual interviews in the workshop, and we asked each person, OK, so if you think about sustainability of mobility in your country, what type of criteria do you think are important? And of course, many people, many people are, um, yeah, they say, yeah, and we are not specialists on uh, sustainability, so we don't know. So to deal with that, we have sort of prepared a um, a document where all these different standard criteria were included, just in case somebody wanted to check, uh, they could go into this. So for example, here you see as, uh, then the trajectory sitting solar PV. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, these are the criteria of uh, one person. And for example, this person said air quality is important, accessibility, energy security, comfort, equity, emissions, and each time, the one who is interviewing can make uh, a detailed uh, explanation of what is meant. Because sometimes people say something, they call it, but they mean something different. So that's, that's why these descriptions. Um, then assessing scores. So that means that for every trajectory, for all the criteria, this one is for example local benefits and this is fiscal benefits, every person says what they think about cycling and walking. Is it locally beneficial in terms of finances? What's interesting about this tool is that you can say, okay, under this condition this is not going to work. But if, for example, uh, uh, the banks are on board, well, that can be a very uh, viable option. So you can express your uncertainty, and you can also provide explanation, which is being recorded in the, in the system. <coughs> so this is about exploring uncertainty. And then uh, you get a sort of uh, a visualization of, of your uncertainty. So this is your lowest score, 
and this is the highest score, and you have a description behind this bar which clarifies exactly why did you score it in that way. Then, of course, as in every criterion, you have question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so what was the uncertainty you, me uh, you, you measured? Uh, it's, it's personal uncertainty of a person who is expressing uh, their views about sustainability. So, for example, you are not a specialist, technical specialist, and yeah. you are being asked about a very technical issue. So you can give a very wide range of, yeah, uh, I think that uh, if we have materials available, then I'm very positive that this will work. Yeah, 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 okay, thanks. But if we don't have these materials available, then it's not a viable option yeah. under specific criteria, okay? So it's your personal uncertainties. And then, um, <coughs> as in every appraisal method, you can weigh. So you can say which one is for you the most important. Is it air quality that you value most? Is it the social benefits or is it uh, financial aspects? Uh, so something that is uh, specific for every uh, Appraisal. And again, you can also express your uncertainty about that, uh, which is visible in this type of bars. At the end, all the participants, it's a very uh, bottom-up participatory type of uh, tool, all the participants are shown individual outcomes, and you can still go back and say, now I disagree with that, I think we have to uh, 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 correct it. So. Um, Whichever stage you have sort of have uh, uh, some uh, uncertainties about, you can check it. You can correct it. So, if there are no questions, are there any questions about the method? Yeah, just, a, yeah. just a question. How many interviews did you conduct? Yeah, I will clarify that. Okay. So, we had about uh, 15 people uh, for every trajectory in every country. It's a very limited uh, sample. And the last one? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I missed maybe the underlying sort of premise or question, but I noticed all the options were alternatives. Did you include current hybrid vehicles or regular fuel guzzling vehicles as well? Well, so as I explained, this was a very emergent approach. We looked what's happening on the ground. We had a certain lens of looking. We looked at the sustainability experiments, which were defined in a certain way. So there was a sort of arbitrary process on our part in terms of what was selected and also the grouping it's also our anal analysts uh, work uh, it's something that you could do with participants if you have the time you can also do the uh, identification of these trajectories or options in a very participatory way but we had this setup so this is our research um, uh, work that was uh, yeah, manifested itself in these trajectories based on what we've seen. And of course, uh, people could have uh, made comments about that, and they, they have. And someone, for example, like you, said, no, I missed something. So we added the trajectory. I think it was agriculture. Um, Hafiz uh, said something, do you remember? Yeah, yeah so but we I added. Mean, the, the, no, the simple thing is we didn't know this was about alternatives. And if it wasn't that conventional. So I mean, just in terms of exploring what sustainable might mean, someone has a perception, well, you know, I want my gas guzzler because it just gives me more security as their sure. notion of what sustainability means. Sure. But, yeah. uh, no, so these were really alternatives to the, um, driven by the definition of sustainable experiments, so non-fossil based type of solutions. But of course, you can include such an alternative. If your research question is uh, such that you want to, yeah, compare the two with each other. Yeah? Was agriculture put in to include the food system to, uh, I just want to refer to the <coughs> calculation that a uh, German colleague of mine made and he uh, compared private vehicle and bicycle and the additional energy that goes in the bicycle because you need to eat more. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then it came out that the bike is, uh, I should yeah. say it's not much bigger. I understand. That's exactly, uh, that's exactly uh, uh, visualized what happened also in our workshop. 
because uh, obviously these trajectories that we have identified are very technological. We made a conscious choice. But you could also identify them in terms of systems. And agriculture popped up, I think, at that time because uh, of the impact all these different technological trajectories not only have on energy, but also on agriculture. So, um, yeah, I think it's a set of assumptions that go together. So if you want to do it in a very participatory way, you can. But we had a very specific question which uh, we which drove our choices, let's put it that way. Right. Okay, yeah. Um, since you ask about how, uh, what they see as sustainability, did they, uh, participants in the first place, already state that they uh, had an, a sustainable initiative? Uh, many people who were participating, yes, they were somehow involved in uh, projects that were covered by one of those trajectories. Okay, but it was not necessarily their intention in the first place to have a sustainable initiative, like to be sustainable. Oh, in that sense. Um, yes, I think this is an interesting question because, um, yeah, many things happen without this big idea of uh, contributing to bigger sustainability. I think yesterday we were talking with Caroline, she's doing this uh, project on, uh, on solar PV. Uh, I think her primary objective is to, 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 to provide with local needs. She's driven by the sustainability ideas, but she does not uh, do it because she wants to contribute maybe to climate change, you know? So, um, yeah, there is a disparity in that sense. Um, so it was our researchers' perspective employed on identifying those initiatives that we thought were, yeah, sustainable. Sometimes uh, there are projects that have very clear, we looked actually at the descriptions of these experiments. So we tried to also, from the ex description of the experiments, identify if they really think about these big goals or are they only about local needs, okay? So th th we did a lot of work on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was an arbitrary decision, yeah? Okay, so then uh, this is uh, what you asked about, uh, uh, 14 interviews, many academics, many people with sustainability minded, um, different number of criteria most occurring in Thailand, politics, governance, policy, costs, technical issues. You probably don't see much environment here. In uh, India, it's about affordability, financial issues, awareness, uh, corruption, profitability were not very popular. And the same I can say about mobility, but it's not the point uh, I want to yeah, so there, yeah, you have to take it uh, as granted. Um, what we did when we had all these different uh, criteria, we have tried to group it, to group it. That's again a moment where you, uh, we apply our analysts' uh, perspective. Um, usually when you do this uh, type of exercise, you are sort of driven by these three economic, environmental, and social Brundtland type of uh, categorizations. But what popped up very clearly in both countries was the technical aspects and the policy aspects that very strongly influenced uh, people's uh, decision about sustainability of specific trajectories. So uh, I have now one slide for each diversity. We had way more pictures because you it, it's a plethora of uh, of results that you get from this tool, but I, I don't want to spend much time about that. So I'll have one slide for each one. So what you can see here is solar PV for India, <coughs> different trajectories, and assessed picture for all the groups. So imagine you are doing the exercise, you provide uh, your input, and this is an aggregated uh, visualization. What this shows is the lowest ranking given by an individual person. So for example, you were most critical about power plants, so your score is coming here, individual score. And this is the maximum. And this is the mean, expressing the average of all the participants. 
Now, interesting uh, observation is lightning. It's about solar lanterns. So these like ones that we received yesterday. Uh, people were pessimistic about it because um, no, they were. I sh oh, I, I, um, I, uh, I should have this description here and this one here. So they were pessimistic about lanterns because they are very much subsidy dependent. That was the reason. So uh, they thought that as long as subsidies come in, people have access to these lanterns. But they were pessimistic, I'm sorry for this, because uh, they were optimistic because it's a decentralized type of source. It's easy, it reaches many people. So it's a very inclusive type of uh, solution. Also environmental impacts are negligible. So that, that's, type of, that's the type of explanation you get um, when you see this picture. And of course, you can say a lot about all the options, but it's not the point uh, now. Again, this is for mobility in Thailand. Again, what you see is that cycling and walking was seen by the majority of people as sort of more sustainable, so that, that you can see. But what's behind is what's interesting, because the explanation, why do people think cycling and walking is so interesting for Thailand? It's because it's non-high tech. In Thailand, you have in the cities, you have many little roads, which you cannot access in a different way than just by walking and cycling. So it's a sort of uh, uh, inclusive solution. It's compatible with infrastructure, but if we wanted to shift the whole system, yeah, we need a lot of behavioral change, okay? So this type of explanations go behind this type of pictures. In terms of appraisal diversity, so how different different uh, actors assessed it, again, we grouped them in different ways. We also looked at them individually. Now, what is interesting, it's mobility case in uh, India and in Thailand you will see that the social criteria were most found as uh, most of them, most criteria were identified, and also the most, uh, yeah, the weights, the, the importance of these criteria was the highest uh, because of policy dependence, because of corruption, subsidy, time predictability. Um, here in India, using a car is a status issue, so people do not switch easily. So this has to uh, be taken into account. You can also look at how individuals differ. Here is an engineer, and here is an academic. And you can go after why. Why their uncertainties are so different. And because you make notes, you have a very rich explanation of, of the situation. The sectoral, so how different um, um, systems compare. I have to apologize for the scale, so I make you sensitive to that. Um, here, uh, for example, for, uh, for Thailand, the, the social issues popped up as very important, uh, and I think it's a mobility sector. People just don't want to bike or walk because that's unsafe. That, that, that was something that we also were told yesterday, that we are brought here by cars because it's not safe to, work, to walk. So that's, that was the major reason. Uh, here, policy. In Thailand, people think that whatever government supports uh, will fly. If the government does not support, then there is, there is a problem. So that's why the policy issues were so very important. And then when you compare across countries, then you also have, um, yeah, you can group uh, based on the, uh, yeah, groups of stakeholders, you can group based on the types of uh, criteria. So I hope my message, uh, you got the message, uh, uh, that my message is across, um, that um, it is a very rich and uh, opening up type of tool, which does not close the discussion, it opens up, I think, um, of course, it's, it's a lot of bias in this, and, and we always have to deal with that as researchers. But um, yeah, when it comes to uh, sort of advice to policy, uh, yeah, at least these people have a rich uh, understanding of, uh, of the rationale behind the, the different appraisals. 
So uh, in terms of conclusions, three conclusions, and these are my last three slides. Um, many criteria, a lot of uncertainties, ranking across different sectoral national contexts differ, differ among the groups. So that means, that really proves that we can't take the sustainability aspect as given and as granted. We really have to spend time on um, yeah, unpacking it uh, because also in singular so social technical fields, you know, sometimes you see similar rankings, you think it's the same, but it's not actually. So we can't really, uh, we have to engage more with, the, with this type of appraisals. And the last one is that yeah, this is interesting because uh, <clears throat> one of the trends in sustainability transitions is that we always say that we do a lot of national cases, we should go broader, but I think in this case of appraisal of sustainability, I think we have to take context very seriously into account. So this would be it. Thank you very much for listening. I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, I'll let it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just my question, because you had a lot of focus on the methodology. Yes. Uh, I, I wondered, and you know my background, so uh, like, can you reflect a little bit on the, on the impact of the small sample size for generalizing your findings? Yeah. So we were very careful in um, our paper to say very general things about India, about Thailand, about urban mobility. So in terms of scientific decency and rigor, we were really analyzing only the case. So we were not uh, saying, oh, India is like that, Thailand is like that, you know? So we stick to our case. But of course, you may say, this is a very limited number of interviews that we have done. But we were also informed by research, because it was a program with several PhDs, and everyone did bits and pieces. So we had a good understanding of what's going on uh, in terms of, yeah dynamics in these two fields, in two countries. Yeah, yeah it's just if you quantify the data, you have a, a, like groups of 15, then, then yeah. like from that you uh, statistically see, you cannot draw these conclusions you no, did. Yeah. I agree, I yeah. agree. So indeed, this is not really quantifying the qualitative data, it's quanti quantified uh, visualization of the qualitative data. That's yeah. how I would uh, yeah. Yeah, frame it sense. very cautiously. Okay. I'm a hardware engineer and um, I wondered if you say it opens up discussion and don't get to a conclusion, do they, can the engineers deal with this? With this? Oh, there were many engineers. And they are happy. With this type of appraisal? <laughs> <laughs> they are because I imagine if you're a computer scientist or engineer, then you put the numbers and then you weigh something and then you would expect that some optimization sort of thing comes out of it, but how do you deal with the expectations? So you basically come up with results and then you open up more questions and yeah. it's great. So how do you deal with the process being ever-ending or being opening up things? I really like it because I'm yeah. only an engineer, but yeah. I just wonder if you have any experience. Uh, no, like we don't because actually the appraisal we have done was at the works, in a workshop setting. So uh, after the workshop we have, well, first of all, we have informed all the people that we will do this type of analysis that we will make a report and that they will have space to comment on it. But you know how life is, right, with every project. So we did not have a follow-up process which could sort of deal with the new questions uh, that are popping up. Uh, what we have done, after we have done all the analysis, there was a short break, we have fed the system and we have opened up uh, the discussion with people. Uh, and it sort of fed into the rationale, into explaining why, what, what comes out of it. Uh, we did not really have a never-ending story in a way. So it is just my one experience, when well, I had two experiences because my other students did it, but no, it, it did not occur, but I can imagine it can. Yeah. I, maybe I, you started this, I mean, uh, thanks a lot for showing this pluralizing of sustainability and opening up and I think that the method is really interesting. Yeah. You started saying that this journey started where when the reflections on sustainability experiments was just beginning. Yes. And now we're about yeah. eight years 
after that, and, and this has become a, a huge conversation, at least in, in our field. Yeah. Uh, and, and I wonder, so I was looking back on, on this uh, original definition that you have in France's paper, plant initiatives that embody a highly novel socio-technical configuration, plant initiatives. So I, I wonder if you can reflect on these last eight years of work on experiments, uh, can we pluralize these this understanding of experiments as well, in a way? I mean, I, I, Franz and I have been working over the last year, maybe it's not a question, maybe it's more common. On the last year, we've been working on this issue of uh, experiments really, really uh, uh, opening up, I suppose. And we see that uh, you can also have very large sliding scales between highly planned experiments and on the other extreme, completely informal, I think we've called them ad hoc experiments. So the, the experimenters themselves are don't not know. necessarily aware that yeah. they're experimenting. Yeah. 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 yeah, I don't know if this is something that you see. Yeah, I guess that's it. It's something we had in mind. I don't know, Franz, maybe you also want to speak up about that because you had quite an impact on that, how it was defined. But uh, yes, indeed, um, we are dealing with real life initiatives, right? Um, we call them experiments. The notion of experiment embeds, in a way, um, the plant character, right? Um, uh, so people plan things, but sometimes not, uh, not with this long vision of uh, willing to, to, co to contribute to sustainability or to whatever. So it's, uh, yeah. Initiatives just happen, and by having this definition, I think we want I, we want to make space for all the different initiatives uh, because uh, yeah, it would be harmful not to include them, not to give them the space. But yeah, these are things that happen out there, not in a lab. Uh, real life uh, experimentation, uh, real life uh, um, initiatives, and you, as an analyst, I think we we'll only tell ex post. Uh, 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 sometimes you just don't know what small thing will lead to. Uh, yeah, France. Uh, you no, no, no. I think you sort of perfectly. Yeah, that I think uh, you know traditionally in innovation studies, what happens again? You, you look at the firm. So you, the firm invests in a project to develop a new computer or something, and you you hire engineers and you have a a launch date for the product, and and that's how innovation is thought of. But in these kinds of contexts, of course, what happens is you have you have some a neighborhood, some activists in the neighborhood think they want to develop a new hybrid electric, uh, you, you had a tuk-tuk, didn't you, yeah. or something. Well, that doesn't, it's not embodied within a firm. It's a, it's a much more informal, emergent social group that then works on that, which may involve some uh, research funding or, or involvement with a firm, but it's, it's a much more diffuse kind of uh, social context, and, and it's somehow including all of those in, in, in research, which is one of the analytical puzzles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but on the other hand, we can't really close it down. Eh? So uh, uh, there is an um, uh, intended uh, uh, action towards opening up, uh, actually. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think uh, I like the title of the presentation, which is saying exploring sustainabilities, you know, and I think the danger we have of trying to define one form of sustainability is we're going to have the broad thing that we do. And uh, I think you demonstrated really well the, the usefulness of this tool in getting to the rationale of what people perceive things, uh, perceive different uh, te technologies, modes to be sustainable. Um, I think it would be interesting is then to bring that back, and may maybe this is done. Look forward to reading the paper. I don't understand. Um, so what so sorry, again? I'm finishing a thought. So um, it would be interesting to see yeah. bringing the cases back to the theory and seeing what types of sustainabilities different people are uh, imposing on these specific cases. Uh, because I, I didn't, I don't know, um, I didn't see a lot of definitional pieces. You sort of allude to ex uh, economy, um, society, environment. Um, and I'm sure in all the different attributes which people selected, that was quite interesting. So I'd be curious to see if you take your case of your engineering perspective on the bicycle from the one range of pessimist yeah. to optimist, yeah. what sustainabilities are at play. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that would be fascinating then in terms of your next question. Well, does the person who says they love bicycles because they're sustainable actually ride a bicycle? 
um, and that might inform yeah, yeah, uh, the action on that. But what's beautiful is exactly that this type of uh, research procedure opens up these questions. I mean, it stimulates you to think about more follow-up research questions. So we did not have the time to do it. There's also an issue of generalization with a small sample, so you have to be cautious there. But yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, I think it's so broad that you can do whatever you like, and uh, as long as you justify the, the well, choices. And, and I think the sample size to me isn't necessarily the, the <coughs> problem at all. I think you can make interesting illusions as to what types of theories are at play in the space, and maybe they're applicable elsewhere, and maybe not. But I think. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think I have to finish, right? No, I do. Yeah, well, uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, if there is the one last question, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Just make one other. So, so you know, the great sociologists of technology uh, argue in the process of the normalisation of, uh, of of anything, you also have to have um, a sort of standard way of talking about the technology. So, there's that famous study by Biker about about bicycles actually, and the point about the the, the model of bicycle that in the end it became dominant, which is the one we all use, is that the entrepreneur that developed it was able to argue that it was the safest. So you talk about the safety bicycle. The safety bicycle in the end won out over the many, many different Design. varieties of designs <coughs> that were available. And so the point about cycling in the early stages, but it was seen as an, an extremely unsafe thing to do. People would fall off and break their bones and all, all the time, it was uncomfortable all the time. So what you do is you have, what we're seeing with these alternatives is a whole variety of different possible descriptions of their benefits and costs. And as they become more mature, more, 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 more ordered, more, more, more normalized, also, the definitions of the benefits and costs become standardized, closed down, simplified. And that is a lot of what is going on in the process of innovation, is a kind of dominant view of what a thing is for, and what its benefits and costs might be, and why it's an acceptable way of doing things, where previously we were confused about that. So that's actually one of the really interesting social institutional processes that is happen happening in, in this emergence of radical alternatives which become normalized and accepted. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Thank you.